Today on the Perception and Action Podcast, the first in a three-part series on the constraints-led approach to coaching. What exactly are constraints? What are some common misconceptions about them? Why is understanding the theory behind them critical for using the constraints-led approach effectively? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, the first in a three-part series on the constraints-led approach to coaching, or CLA for short. For those that don't know, the CLA involves manipulating constraints in practice to help an athlete find their own effective movement solution for their sport. But what does all that really mean? Today, I want to look at the theoretical construct of a constraint. To me, this is incredibly important to understand because it has a highly specific meaning that does not always align with our everyday conception of the word. So, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. In the second episode in this series, I will look at the dynamics of coordination specifically focusing on behavioral and ecological dynamics theories. Finally, in the third part in this series, I will move to a discussion of research that has evaluated the effectiveness of the CLA, including the results of a study I recently completed looking at using it for training baseball batters and how it compared to other commonly used coaching methods. The CLA as a coaching tool has evolved from some basic attempts to understand and model a problem related to the organization of behavior. And while many practitioners might be tempted to jump over this boring background in theory and leap right into using the CLA, I think this is a real mistake, because it would be highly likely that you won't employ it properly and effectively. The CLA involves principled practice design, not just willy-nilly changes in the size of the field, the weight of the ball, or the number of players. In a nutshell, I think understanding the theory behind it is key to using the CLA effectively. So let's dive in. I mentioned that the CLA arose from attempts to solve a problem. What was this problem? Well, it was first described by the OG of the area himself, J.J. Gibson. Slightly paraphrasing here, quote, Goal-directed actions are controlled not by the brain, but by information. Control lies in the animal environment system. The rules that govern behavior are not like laws enforced by an authority or decisions made by a commander. Behavior is regular without being regulated. The question is, how can this be? So, Gibson was essentially dissatisfied with the traditional indirect theories of behavior, which assumed that the control of action relies on some internal, centralized controller, the brain CEO, if you will. In traditional views, This CEO uses a general purpose model or representation of the environment provided by our perceptual system. As I discussed back in episode 20C, Gibson disliked this approach for a few reasons. First, there is a chicken and egg problem here. Assuming behavior is controlled by a centralized controller essentially just displaces the problem of behavioral organization to some pre-existing internal structure where it's never really explained where this structure came from in the first place. Second, and more importantly, Gibson believed that creating detailed representations and 3D internal models of our environment was inefficient and completely unnecessary, because there is rich, task-specific perceptual information available in our environment that we can use to control the actions needed to reach our goal. This dismissal of the idea of the central controller introduces the concept of self-organization, which is central to the CLA. Without a CEO around to run things, all the workers in a company are going to have to organize themselves. So, for Gibson, there were two fundamental questions that are highly relevant to effective coaching that he needed answers to. Question one, how can we account for the organization and behavior without attributing it to an internal control structure? Or in other words, What guides this self-organization process? And question two, how can an organism produce behaviors that are stable, yet at the same time adaptive? And while there have been many contributions to answering these questions that have come over the years, including many by Gibson himself, 
Today, I want to focus on the critical idea of constraints on coordination. So what are constraints and where did they come from? Now, we could go back and forth arguing about who came up with which idea and when it appeared and which paper and which book chapter and so on and so forth. Constraints is a concept that has evolved and been refined over time. But I'm going to focus on just one particular source and my interpretation of its key messages. The 1986 book chapter by Carl Newell called Constraints on the Development of Coordination. Among the many contributions of this chapter, it provided the first version of the official logo of the CLA, the familiar Constraints Triangle, which if you haven't noticed yet is also part of the new logo for this podcast. Interestingly, this chapter is not really about skill acquisition at all. It's about perceptual motor development in infants. But if you've listened to the podcast long enough, I hope you have gotten the sense there are a lot of similarities between these two things. In this chapter, Newell was trying to put forth a different view to the traditional thinking about how kids develop motor skills, especially Gessel's idea that our genes carry prescriptions for actions that emerge at different time points, which I reviewed back in episode 38. Similar to Gibson, Newell argued that our movements were not prescribed by anything. There's no CEO in our head. Instead, they emerge as the result of a self-organization process that is bound by the ever-changing constraints imposed upon us. So there's that magic word, constraint. What exactly does it mean? In this context, a constraint is something that eliminates certain possibilities or configurations for action. So key point number one, actions are not caused by constraints. When a new constraint is added, it's not prescribing a particular action or solution from the performer. Rather, constraints serve to exclude some actions or solutions. So the performer still comes up with their own movement solution through self-organization. It's just that their potential options for doing this have been reduced or constrained. Key point number two, adding a constraint does not necessarily make an action more complex or difficult. It can, for example, if the constraint takes away the easiest and most attractive movement solution, but adding a constraint can equally make coming up with an effective solution easier by narrowing the range of possible options available. Another way to think of it is, adding constraints can help to solve Bernstein's degrees of freedom problem by eliminating solutions that will not work. Key point number three, constraints in our environment vary in their degree of time dependence. Some constraints change very quickly, while others are slow to change. At the one extreme are time-independent structural constraints, like our body weight and our body height, while at the other end are highly time-dependent functional constraints that change from moment to moment, like the specific defense being played by an opponent on a given play in sports. This time-dependence is the key to answering the second of Gibson's questions. Relatively time-independent constraints promote stability, while highly time-dependent ones require adaptability. Okay, let's get into some more specifics. In Newell's model, there are three types of constraints that a performer must accommodate when coming up with a movement solution. Environmental, task, and individual. These three constraints are commonly depicted as the vertices of a triangle. Environmental constraints are things that are typically not manipulated by a coach and that are relatively time independent. That is, they don't really change very quickly. Things like gravity, temperature, and light level. So, these could be thought of as kind of the ambient conditions in which a particular task is being performed. However, key point number four here, not every feature of a performance environment is a constraint. Remember, constraints restrict the possibility for actions. So whether or not a particular feature of the environment is a constraint or not depends on the nature of the task being performed. For example, unless we're talking about gale force conditions, wind is not really a constraint for field hockey because the ball is heavy, travels very fast, and is usually kept close to the ground. Conversely, wind is a major constraint for football where the ball frequently travels long distances high in the air, such that on really windy days, the movement solutions available to a quarterback, that is the ways in which they can pass the ball, get reduced. An environmental condition is only relevant here 
to the extent to which it constrains the possible movement solutions a performer can use. Okay, now let's turn to task constraints. Noel proposed there are three categories of these. The goal of the task, the rules specifying or constraining the response dynamics, and the equipment or implements which specify or constrain the response dynamics. So, as the name implies, task constraints are highly specific to the action or sport being performed. In many ways, these are the most important for a coach to understand because they will typically be the ones that you will manipulate in practice. Let's look at a basketball example to illustrate. Imagine you're a point guard dribbling the ball down the court towards the basket. First, obviously the rules of basketball, for example, double dribbling and carrying the ball, constrain the way in which you can move down the court. Second, the properties of the equipment, the ball, also constrain the movement solutions. How much the ball is inflated will constrain the combination of forces and timing that will result in successful dribbling. Finally, your goal constrains the solutions. Is your goal to score, three points or two points, run out the clock, etc. If you're down by three with five seconds left, the option of driving the ball to the hoop for a layup is probably gone. Again, the key here is that task constraints do not specify the exact pattern of coordination that has to be used. For example, there's lots of ways to dribble legally. They constrain or limit them. The one exception to this are sports that have strong restrictions and actually reward form, like gymnastics. However, even in these cases, there is still room for self-organization in individuality. Finally, there are individual or organismic constraints. These are things that obviously reside within the performer themselves. Common ones we might think of are height, range of motion, and maximum speed but they really include things at every level of analysis within an organism, all the way from broad structural traits to the rate at which an individual can form new synaptic connections in their brain. A couple key points here. First, whether a characteristic of an individual is a constraint depends on the nature of the task they're performing. For example, as I've discussed many times on the podcast now, visual acuity may or may not be a constraint depending on the performer's task. Second, of course, if we have identified a specific individual characteristic as a constraint on performance in a specific task, it may be possible to address this through strength and conditioning training. But it's likely going to take a long time, and the training needs to be highly specific. A few more important points about constraints. Key point number five. Constraints can be both motoric and informational. In general, I think when people hear the word constraint, they think mostly of the former. That is, constraints affect the way that we can coordinate our bodily movements to generate our actions. But a constraint can equally affect the information that we can use to control our actions. A very simple example is distance. For sports in which a performer is required to act on an object that is really far away, say a golfer lining up a long approach shot, using binocular stereoscopic cues will be effectively eliminated as a possible solution because stereo cues are not effective at large distances. And there are many other examples of this I will be talking about next time. Key point number six. How an athlete interprets or understands the constraints can be very important. An interesting example of this Newell discusses in his chapter is the breaststroke event in swimming. The original rule, or task constraint, for this event was that the legs and arms need to move simultaneously and in synchrony. For many years, many swimmers assumed that this also meant that the legs and arms had to be kept underwater. Or in other words, they added a task constraint that wasn't really explicitly stated in the rule book. Well, in the 1930s, one swimmer interpreted this in a different way, when he realized you can generate a lot more power by going out of the water. This, of course, led to the development of a new event with different task constraints, the butterfly. So, and this is essential. The CLA to coaching is not completely removing cognition from the performance equation. Cognition is key for determining the task goal and interpreting what is and isn't a constraint. It is just that the CLA and the associated theories argue that high-level cognition, a centralized CEO, is not involved in coming up with a specific movement solution to achieve the goal. 
In other words, it is possible to set a goal without dictating how it will be achieved. Key point number seven, perhaps the keyest of them all, is something that hopefully has been evident in most of the discussion today. Skilled performance is determined by the interaction between individual task and environmental constraints. The three points of Noel's triangle form a system that each and every athlete in each and every sport is bound by. This has a couple critical implications for me. First, if you pull the athlete out of this system, you are not training the athlete as effectively as you could be. Second, effective training has to start with a detailed functional task analysis of the specific sporting task the athlete is training for. A good example of this can be seen in a recent review of change of direction and agility tests published by Sophia Nymphius and colleagues. If you follow me on Twitter, you know this is something I've been railing about recently. In high-level sport, there is no such thing as a general skill like quote-unquote change of direction or quote-unquote agility. When we think of abilities this way, we're pulling the athlete out of the constraints triangle and ignoring the specific task and environmental constraints of their sport. The abilities of athletes are highly adapted to the specific constraints of their sport and need to be trained as such. And this is exactly what Nymphius and colleagues found in their article. Quoting the last sentence of the paper, from a coaching perspective, there is not a single way to change direction. And therefore, a combined consideration of outcome and process, for example, what was the performance and result, and how was it attained, will ultimately provide the most comprehensive applied assessment of change of direction performance. End quote. In other words, being able to change direction quickly has to be defined relative to the specific task in the sport you are coaching. What is the angle of entry? What is the exit velocity? What is the intention of the change? What perceptual information is used to guide the change of direction? Answering these questions is critical to developing a practice drill that will help an athlete find a movement solution that will transfer to their sport. Okay, to end today's episode, I want to give a few practical take-home messages by reviewing some common misunderstandings about the nature of constraints and the CLA to coaching. Hopefully, this will lead to more principled and effective implementation of the CLA for those that are interested in trying it out. Point number one. In the CLA, constraints do not cause actions or prescribe specific movement solutions. If your goal is to constrain the performance to such a degree that it makes the performer have the quote-unquote perfect ideal technique, then you're doing it wrong. The name of the game is guiding self-organization. Point number two. The CLA is the very definition of it depends. These two words are ones that you will hear a lot by certain people in coaching circles. The basic idea is, it, how you coach, depends, has to be adjusted for the specific athlete and the specific situation. I completely agree with this, but I hope that today's discussion has convinced you that it depends is an inherent property of the CLA. By definition, Allowing an athlete to self-organize in the face of individual task and environmental constraints means every athlete and every situation will need to be coached differently. Point number three, not every characteristic of an athlete, every aspect of a task, and every aspect of an athlete's environment is a constraint. Constraints are specific factors that remove certain movement solutions. So not everything you add or take away from a practice drill is a constraint. Which leads to point number four, effective use of the CLA critically relies on first performing a detailed task analysis of your sport and a detailed analysis of the movement solution that the particular athlete is currently using. Constraints have to be manipulated with these two things in mind. What is the specific aspect of the coordination solution I want to change in the athlete? How is this related to their specific task? How can I alter the constraints in practice to encourage them to find a better solution? These are the questions that have to be answered before the CLA can be effectively implemented. And I don't think everyone is taking the time to do this properly. I will give some specific examples of how to develop an effective constraint in the other parts of this series. Point number five, manipulating constraints in practice can equally make a task more difficult as it can simplify it. 
I think this is an important point because I hear many say you shouldn't use the CLA until the athlete has nailed the basics or fundamentals of their skill. Well, I think this is an incorrect view. If designed correctly, the CLA can help an athlete learn these quote-unquote basics by narrowing the possible options that a new learner has to work through. Point number six. In sports, many of the constraints an athlete faces will change very frequently, so your practice design needs to reflect this. So, for example, you may want to keep one constraint in place until a movement pattern becomes relatively stable, that is, the movement is within some acceptable bandwidth you've defined, then change the constraint to promote the other important side of the coin, adaptability. Okay, to sum up, today I looked at the first component of the constraints-led approach to coaching, the concept of constraints. If this was all there was to it, I would agree with the assessment of some that it's really nothing revolutionary or new. Okay, we have to take into account our own individual abilities and the requirements of our sport. Nothing really groundbreaking there. And if we just stopped here, we'd really be within the realm of a quite different approach called teaching games for understanding. But, and this is another misconception, there's a lot more to the CLA than just the concept of constraints. The second key piece is what I'll focus on next time, dynamics. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakyWaits. And to find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone through St. Louis.